So we're live. Hello. We are Evelina Domnic and Dimitri Gelfand, an artist duo participating in the Studiotopia Scientist in Residency program. Our artworks explore gases, liquids, and exotic forms of light while simultaneously retuning our sensorial and perceptual capacities. So hello from The Hague and uh, today with us uh, are Florian Schreck joining from the University of Amsterdam where he is a, a, a professor of experimental quantum physics um, investigating ultra cold gases and their potential as hypersensitive measuring devices and from Brussels we are joined by Guillaume um, Schweicher, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Université Libre, and um, he creates um, uh, organic and hybrid electronics. Among the peacekeeping efforts after the First World War was the coordination of a global clock. Finally, by January the 1st, 1960, a worldwide time signal standard was launched, corresponding to the radiation frequency of a cesium-133 atom at a temperature of zero Kelvin. The era of atomic clocks was born. Despite the apparent centrality of time signatures for biological and perceptual processes, as well as for innumerable scientific, logistic, and communicational ends. According to various theoretical physicists and philosophers, the time dimension might not even exist. How is time present in your research? Well, thank you very much for the introduction and good morning to everyone. So as they said, my name is Guillaume and I'm working in the field of organic electronics, meaning that I'm using carbon-based materials to produce electronic devices. Where well, it's interesting is because we are using um, synthesis, chemical synthesis to produce these materials are way cheaper cost and we also reduce the amount of energy that we consume for them. So it's really a greener alternative to conventional silicon uh, electronics. So more specifically, no, how time is uh, important in my research. I mean, time is a very interesting concept. And uh, when you're interesting, uh, interested in to the aspects of charge transport, you can really see two different time scale. So the first important thing about time is the scale that you consider on the very large scale, like meaning a time of one second, like in the transistor, the electronic devices that I'm using, the charge uh, is traveling on longer distance. Uh, but if you really want to understand how um, to modify these materials to improve the charge transport properties and to make them more efficient for next uh, electronics, you need to understand what's going on at very small time scale and length scale meaning that now we are working on the time of a picosecond, 10 minus 12 seconds. And for that, we really need to use a spectroscopic methodology to probe what's going on. Because my materials are based on big molecules, organic molecules, they are vibrating uh, at uh, room temperature. And uh, so we really want to track down which vibration are impacting to what extent the charge transport mechanism to improve them. So really time is an interesting concept because you can have large time scale, small time scale, but also there is another very interesting point is that nothing is really constant as well. I mean, this mm -hmm. value of the speed of charge in my material can be changed by temperature pressure. And it's really the moment, the instant I'm tracking down these values that I can get an information. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you. so you're also interested to know how time intervenes in my research, yes? Most certainly. And so, um, of course, in many different ways. The most obvious one is 
that we are trying to construct a completely new type of optical atomic clock. So in, in these clocks, we, we use ultra cold atoms, atoms that nearly are at standstill, like the, the one you see behind here, behind <laughs> on, on, this, on this image. <laughs> these are atoms that are millikelvin cold. And we use them uh, to precisely read out an atomic transition, a certain color of light, and this makes our clock tick. So this is the first thing, we try to build a clock. The second thing is that to produce these ultra cold atoms, our experiments usually go through a time sequence of steps. We produce a gas of atoms in an oven and then we cool them down uh, over time in, in various laser cooling and other cooling stages. And that takes a minute or so, step after step. And we have a research line in which we try to convert this from executing these stages one after the other in time into executing these stages one after the other in space. So we convert time into a spatial dimension, so to say. And this reminded me to what you said in your question, where you said some people, some philosophers, think that time is just an illusion. I mean, that reminded me of the picture of the block universe. That there are just four dimensions, and time is just any other one. And it's just an illusion that we perceive it differently from the spatial dimension. So we are, we are trying to do this. We put the usual time dimension of our experiments into a spatial dimension. And then there are many other things, for example, <laughs> each PhD thesis is limited in time to four years, each day to 24 hours that heavily influences our research. <laughs> no, it's quite amazing that today we, we have uh, some time to talk about time. But um, we, um, uh, answering to Dmitry's question, I can also add that at the moment we are finishing an artwork that is called Time Synthesizer. And uh, indeed, we, uh, we, um, it's, um, it's a kind of time tracking, time keeping device. And uh, Andrew is now graciously showing a little video of it. So uh, uh, as you can see, the flow of water, the, 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 the type of the flow really determines how precise time signatures are. So by changing the properties of the flow, uh, you can measure the time uh, more or less precisely, or let's say the, the different time signatures will differ quite drastically if, for example, the flow becomes turbulent. Yeah, here the, the flow is being traced by uh, microscopic hydrogen bubbles that are emitted by uh, an, an electrode uh, at even intervals mm -hmm. that become quite uneven as the uh, flow changes our perception of time. That's and of course, how do you create the turbulence here? Uh, the, well, the, the turbulence actually is, is, is created quite simply by changing the speed of the flow. And in fact, we don't need to create turbulence. It's, <laughs> it's uh, a little bit It's too... quite the opposite. We try to, to make the flow yes. quite laminar so as to look at this uh, ghostly transition from laminar to turbulent flow and back. Mm. So you can easily control that. And by the <laughs> well, uh, I, I would say that easy uh, is, uh, <laughs> is is definitely uh, an overstatement. <laughs> the, the, there, there's uh, a, a vast uh, a threshold in terms of being able to uh, to look at this 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 very uh, incremental seeding of, of turbulence. Uh, it's, it's, it's a subject that uh, is, is very dear to our hearts. And uh, at, at the end of his life, Werner Heisenberg uh, asked uh, two questions. Uh, why um, relativity and why turbulence? And he had a feeling that uh, God would have an answer to the first question, but not to the second. But um, 
Yeah, perhaps we can uh, we can expand upon the the, the first uh, question. I, I know that uh, you Guillaume had uh, an inquiry. Oh yeah, for the next question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, that I mean, following on uh, what we did, and I mean, basically what you showed as well, that's showing a lot of color, so uh, that it's related as well to light. I mean, we all know that light is uh, fundamental to many processes on Earth. So the question to follow directly what we discussed so far is, oh, is light and its interaction with matter connected to your work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it's... Yes, it's uh, anyway, if you start talking about light, it's like you're sitting on a gold mine. <laughs> it's uh, the, the amount of discoveries you can uh, come upon just thinking about uh, the, nature of, the nature of light, the the way it affects all things, the way it interacts with matter is, uh, yes, among some of the most uh, magical processes. For us, uh, uh, what is uh, very specific for our work with light is we always, um, it's always an interaction be between our um, senses of perception and light. So it is not, um, it is not so much about another fascinating topic, let's say that light moves uh, at a constant at speed. At a finite speed that nothing can move faster. And then even the size and the shape of our universe is determined by how far the light can move from the point of Big Bang. So there are indeed this very interesting spatial and time dependencies as if you cannot even imagine, yes, uh, without light, the, the, the size and the vastness of space. But in our work, uh, light is, um, is really how, how do we perceive it and how um, um, human perception can, just with, the, with our eyes, how we can tap into these uh, very um, non-obvious questions from looking directly at the sun. So we had a work where we uh, look at the sun and the sunspots, which is impossible with our eyes. You just burn them. And then looking at the light of uh, sonar luminescence, which is so um, faint that it is almost on another threshold of your visual capacities. So for us, this is the same. I mean, we detect everything in our experiment also by interacting uh, atoms with light. And it's even more, I mean, our atoms, as I mentioned, they have to nearly stand still, be decoupled from the thermal motion of, I mean, molecules in air fly around with hundreds of meters per second. This would destroy our atoms. So we keep our atoms levitated inside a vacuum chamber and they may not touch anything. So the only thing with which we can influence our atoms are electromagnetic fields. And laser light is very important. We use it to slow down our atoms from hundreds of meters per second velocity to stand still. We use it to trap the atoms, to manipulate their internal state, and then to detect the result of our experiment. Mm -hmm. And it very much con connects to the first question because at the end our readout for, for the clock experiment we have will be uh, an electromagnetic wave, a laser beam. And we just count the number of wiggles of this laser beam. And after a certain number of these uh, wiggles has passed, we say uh, one second has elapsed. That's how the clock works. <laughs> and how you connect light to time. But we, uh, since you talked about lasers, we are also fascinated by um, this very special properties, this uh, very amazing tuning that you can achieve with laser light in phase and coherence. And the whole concept of coherence is very fascinating. So we, we do use laser light in almost all of our artworks and the video that you've seen, it is indeed illuminated by laser light, but we use laser beams as a kind of visual aid, as an optical 
a microscope that crawls so deeply into the uh, micro landscape of matter that you can see much more without using a lens. So it's, um, uh, it's amazing how light just by its particular nature of being coherent and in phase can magnify certain things and act sort of as a magnifying glass. So usually we use uh, laser sheets or kind of diffusing this very coherent light in order to uh, be able to see microscopic bubbles or for example, microscopic um, uh, Transitions. cavities of air in water that will catch light as a lens and then the laser will go and do not illuminate water. So you can create all these amazing optical um, resonances that our eyes are extremely sensitive to. We use it pretty much for the same reasons to detect uh, signal atoms, pretty much in the same way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in in my field, it's the same. I would use light as a, as a laser to uh, to really probe, and uh, I've been using turret uh, spectroscopy to probe the vibration in my material. So again, I mean, I'm using light as a probe to get information. Um, but I mean, other people on the same topic also using light in two different ways. Like you can produce light with light emitting diodes. That's very important as well, a cheaper cost for, I mean, all the, the global issue we are facing so far. And also convert the light from the sun uh, by photovoltaics to produce electricity. That's also very important. I mean, light is, has a lot of uh, applications and utility. Indeed, speaking of uh, photovoltaics, uh, the, the, the way in which uh, light interacts with matter is... Uh, one of the keys to uh, perhaps among the most open uh, questions uh, to this day, and that is uh, how living matter originated uh, by this subtle interaction with sunlight. Uh, of course, uh, it is something that cannot be quite uh, tackled uh, by the biological sciences, uh, nor even by um, more comprehensive uh, domains such as uh, biogeochemistry. But uh, the advantage of uh, engaging in this kind of pursuit uh, via art is that uh, you don't necessarily have to find an answer to the question. You can uh, rather spark potential um, other pursuits that uh, may evoke uh, a horizon of answers. I, I think you showed us an artwork last Friday where you tried to influence dust, was it, with light, which is shown on the light, no? Yes. Because it is more than just detecting what happens, and there you, you do something with your light. Yes, uh, optical pressure, you know, solar, solar sails. So we, indeed, we um, probe light in, uh, in many different ways, trying to indeed move uh, uh, in semi-vacuum, uh, uh, hyper-small diamond particles. And uh, uh, another very fascinating aspect of life that I always try to imagine, it's like a mental exercise, is to see how light propagates through space and to indeed to, because in our art, we always fight against the idea of an object that things are localized and uh, kind of inert. So when you think about light, you, you kind of imagine this field that not only uh, envelops all of us in this kind of uh, very fine vibrations, but also determines the size, the, the shape of our universe. So um, uh, from this point of view, this kind of uh, vibratory 
uh, vertical nature of light is extremely fascinating. And I remember this uh, Russian proverb that probably originated in the 19th century, way before relativity. And it go, I tried to translate into English. It goes like, uh, from window to window goes solar spindle. And this kind of uh, vortex, so at the moment we are fantasizing about future artwork and maybe you can help us developing it where we, with some kind of uh, special uh, well, lens by, or... By I, means of optical vortices, uh, we, we would like to, um, to navigate matter. To see the polarization of light, because we know that many creatures, biological creatures that live on our planet are able to see polarization. But and not only the polarization of light, but also the, the, the helical mode of light, because there, there is both um, mm -hmm. spin uh, angular momentum as well as orbital angular momentum, where the actual wave fronts, the phases uh, of, of light uh, are spinning. Yeah. But I think we maybe got a question. No, no, no. Unfortunately, no questions yet from, from our audience, but uh, <laughs> perhaps they will emerge. <laughs> It's still early. Huh? People are, yes, yes, yes. Are, are waking up. Um, People are still getting caffeinated. Mm -hmm. So coming back to our first question about time, can we connect time and light and our work and, uh, you know, to round up our discussion a bit? Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, uh, the, it's, 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 it's hard not to uh, make a reference to um, Albert Einstein's uh, light clock or blitz box, the, one of his um, original Gedanken experiments where uh, the very idea of, uh, of relativity comes about that uh, in, in, in a moving uh, train, uh, we have uh, light emissions bouncing against a mirror, uh, what, what he called a, a, a blitz box. And, the, and in order to understand how uh, time dilation occurs, we simply have uh, different, um, we, we have in, in different, we have the observer in a different position than, than the moving train. And uh, of course, the reason for using light as the, 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 the frequency of oscillation is because of its constant speed in spite of uh, the, the movement from which it originates. Something that uh, was, was was and perhaps for, for many still is a, a, a perplexing concept because usually speed is dependent on the uh, object from which it originates. Yeah, so in Einstein's time, these were done experiments and now they are realized. We have GPS satellites with clock on, clocks on board and we see um, yeah, time dilation. and. We have built uh, gravitational wave detectors, which work essentially by bouncing light forwards and backwards between mirrors and see gravitational waves. Yeah, we had the uh, extraordinary um, opportunity to uh, collaborate with, with LIGO with this, uh, this laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory and this, uh, the, the fact that that this, this, this warping of space and time on, on the order of uh, the, the 10,000th of uh, the width of a proton is just, it's extraordinary that that kind of precision for testing relativity, among other things, <laughs> exists. <Yeah>, amazing. <laughs> and Guillaume, do you, do you have a kind of... Uh... Conclusion for, for their conclusion for the light matter for interaction. For the time keeping with light. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I mean, uh, from everything we've said, I mean, light matter is uh, extremely important and valuable for every single aspect of life. I mean, in the research, in your art and everything. And um, we can uh, do a lot with light. We need light, uh, which especially for life on hers. Uh, and also very importantly, considering the, the time scale, uh, we have one life one lifetime as well. Uh, and I know that uh, we haven't reached yet really the, the important questions about uh, related to, to the studio topia topic as well. Um, and uh, I think if we want to mix light and uh, time in a very single uh, sentence, that's uh, like you said as well during discussion recently that we have one lifetime and this is the time now to act and try to show what's important and what we need to change in, uh, in our society actually. I know I'm making a big jump from all the discussion we've done so far, but that's linking everything as well, the importance of what we have to do right now. And here and we have an overview of our discussion. And I, I would like to be a devil's advocate at the end and uh, um, comment that, okay, we, we have our sun as a kind of um, reference time frame and the, the movements of the planets and that how all life and organic matter is um, keeping this kind of uh, keeping rhythms, track of time. keeping rhythms yeah. is yes, with the, with the help of the sun. And although it is very difficult to synchronize it with the precision of, uh, um, I don't know, um, 15 zeros after the zero of a second, but uh, uh, somehow the, this system works quite well on the scale of the entire uh, solar system. And if you try to uh, coordinate this very um, precise timekeeping in the technosphere, it becomes so and so complex with each step that at some point the complexity might uh, uh, become uh, uh, impossible to resolve. There's a very quick question that we might try to answer in 20 seconds. Can you <laughs> stop time in specific conditions? Yes, it's xenon effect, quantum xenon effect. Zeno. Yes. yes. <laughs> Look at the quantum xeno effect. So when you observe a quantum system at this moment, time stops. Yeah. Oh, if you will continually observe a quantum system, mm -hmm. time will freeze, and it does now. <laughs> we are out of time. <laughs> it's a good ending word, freeze. 